So thank you for attending. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Jeff Craven here at uh, Central Region SSD. Also on the line, uh, a trooper, John Gagan, who's on mid-shifts this week, uh, decided to get up and join us. He's a lead from Springfield, and uh, he's co-lead of the National Model Blender Outreach Team, along with Jim Siva King. Everybody on the line, I really appreciate your willingness to help us evaluate uh, phase one of the uh, WFO blender output. Uh, we've got roughly 15 offices across the uh, lower CONUS, the lower 48, uh, in four of the six regions looking at this, including the Weather Prediction Center. Uh, looking at the early output, and uh, again, we couldn't couldn't properly evaluate this for the model developers without you. So we appreciate your willingness to participate. I'm going to go ahead and get started. There's several ways that we got to the national blend. Uh, we started doing local and regional model blend initiatives in the Weather Service. And as time went on, we started to see kind of a synergy of, of many different things, both politically and scientifically. The NAPA report had the word consistency all over it, probably about 20 to 30 times. We also had mentioning of an uh, increased need for consistency in our products in the Weather Ready Nation roadmap. And then an interesting study done uh, for actually for a polar orbiter satellite gap mitigation study linking Sandy Supplemental talked about pro uh, trying to elevate projects that make better use of existing model output. And so uh, indirectly, uh, the uh, Sandy Supplemental and Polar Orbiters played a big role in getting the funding uh, for a national blend of models. So the primary goal of the blend is to improve the quality and consistency uh, of our NDFD. The starting point would be looking at days three to eight and deterministic output, which is similar to what we do today, and eventually extending that to probabilistic products out through day 10. Initially, our initial capacity should be two cycles per day, a 0 and a 12Z run. Now, one thing that I want you to keep in mind that as we go through this presentation and also as we as the blender matures, we've come up with a saying in the Weather Ready Nation documents uh, called a common operating picture. And that would be something that in order to reduce confusion with our customers and having, say, three or four different QPF forecasts, one at the WFOs, one at the Weather Prediction Center, maybe a different one used uh, by river forecast centers, perhaps uh, a individual model like the GFS having QPF. We need to move towards having uh, a forecast that our partners can depend on as our weather service forecast. And the common operating picture serves that role in our futuristic documents. We believe that the an iterative step towards the COP is the national blend of models. Components initially would be global models, European and its ensembles, the GFS and its ensembles, and the Canadian ensembles. And eventually, in the somewhat uh, shaded, we would have deterministic Canadian, uh, the FINMOC, which is the, the, the replacement for the Navy no gaps, 
and eventually the UK Met Office is interested in having us uh, uh, having their model participate in this. So the global models is is a initial phase. We do have plans to extend into higher resolution short term models in later phases. Uh, what might be construed as the HREF or high resolution ensemble forecast members would be a part of that, such as the HER. So when you do blends versus single deterministic NWP, you're obviously going to have uh, some smoothing of details. So you, you will the blends because particularly when there's more uncertainty, there will be more smoothing of details in, in these blends. So we're hoping that downscaling will reduce this effect. Uh, and again, when you when you have a lot of uncertainty, if 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 a front is on one set of guidance is in North Dakota and is in Oklahoma and other, it's very hard to portray a very sharp gradient when you have something several states off in the guidance. Maybe not as common in the summer months, but certainly something that we occasionally see in the extended over the cold season. Another thing that uh, can be a drawback is if you've got a lot of uncertainty in wind, particularly wind uh, differences in wind direction, you're going to see erratic behavior at times in the blend. It, it's just a sign of the uncertainty and really won't improve much uh, until the model uh, agreement improves. So some differences. The, the National Blend of Models has dynamic weighting. And what that means is when we some of the regional blends, such as Super Blend or Bias Corrected Consensus All, or some of the other blends that you might see across the regions, most of them, the weights are assigned and don't change, and they're fairly static. For example, the European may be 12% of a blend, the GFS 5%. There's we we. We have the capability, but in practice have not done much with seasonal adjustments. But the national blend of model weightings change daily, and that they harness rolling 30-day verification. So they can change daily and also at each grid point. So we're going to show you some examples from Seattle, Albuquerque, and Atlanta that the weightings on a particular day can be different uh, across the country. And to show you this example, back in March, we're showing you a, a five-day or 120-hour forecast. And these graphs portray the weightings. And there's six different inputs here. So if you Assume that all the models were equally weighted. You would have a a 14% weighting, roughly, for all of them. Here you can see from Seattle in this example, from the 1st of March into just past the middle of March. So this is a little over two weeks. They're not drastic changes, but you do see, for example, the bias-corrected European gridded moss starts here in Seattle around 20% and actually drops off closer to about 18% at the end of the two-week period. You can see again that there there is a fairly large spread. The couple of the models are down around 10% weighting and the European and GFS moss are closer to 18%. And this is at Seattle. And going on the same day at Albuquerque, you see that the weightings here are bunched together a little bit more. Uh, all of the members are above about 11 or 12%. And here you see that the weightings for 
the highest members are down around 17 or 18 percent. Now again, not massive differences from what you would expect to be the standard of say 14 percent in this example, but uh, certainly some variations both geographically and day to day. And here in Atlanta, uh, again an, another variation, but here the bias corrected European GMOS has a little bit higher weighting than some of the the other, and th this is something again that will vary daily, seasonally, and geographically. So data delivery of the blend, there is a fairly substantial latency between the, the time stamped run and when it uh, is available. It's approximately 12 hours at this point. Uh, the actual run time is about 10 and a half to 11 hours, so a 12Z run would be finished on the WCOS supercomputer sometime around 2030, I'm sorry, 2230 to 23Z. And after being shipped around on the, and post-processed and on the LDM, you're talking about roughly 12 hours later, maybe a little bit earlier than that. So a 0Z runs available roughly 12Z, and a 12Z run about 0Z. So the late arrival of the European, and particularly the European ensemble members, is, is what really drives this much later. Again, the out, the, we do expect the output to be on the SBN and generated to AWIPS and GFE just like any other NWP guidance down the line. I don't believe you're, most of us will see it on the SBN until calendar year 216, but uh, certainly the plan is sometime around December that it will be shipped on the SBN. So we expect out, expected outcomes we want the improved deterministic guidance to help with the consistency of the NDFD. We also want to reduce bias and mean absolute error. The probabilistic guidance for extreme events, we're hoping it is something that we don't have a very good supply of now. Things like probability of exceedance for, say, two inches of QPF, things of that nature. We need a lot of the, especially in the extended, a lot of the guidance is of course resolution and good post-processing helps to improve the representation of complex terrain. That's something that we uh, expect to improve with this, and uh, our early results are encouraging. After uh, covering some more about complex terrain, we'll look at a little bit of verification from February and May. First off, though, uh, there's been a lot of work to improve the handling of terrain, and we wanted to pass along that AWIPS build 1511 is coming in the fall. Uh, Raytheon's working on updating the terrain files for AWIPS 2, and there's a goal of having a common terrain for the Blender, the Irma, and GFE uh, by the end of this calendar year, which is definitely not a trivial matter, and it's something that is a uh, very high priority. So what that means, and I, I've shown an example from um, Pueblo, and them pointing out some of the issues with with terrain and elevation and its impacts on the blender output. We expect some of the terrain in AWIPS 2 to change its definition by up to 1,000 meters, which, of course, is uh, 
over 3,000 feet. So this will cause significant changes, and we just want to make sure that uh, no one gets caught off guard, that there will be substantial changes to the AWIPS-2 terrain. So looking at the February temperature, and this is for the whole, the whole CONUS, I believe, uh, the NDFD mean absolute error is in the blue circles, and the, the blend is in this purple X. Now, I'll talk about on, the, on future slides that this is a little bit of apples and oranges. So what you're seeing is a 12Z, uh, for example, a 12Z forecast being validated against something that wasn't available until 0Z, so it's not really a fair fight. So we'll, we've uh, done some changes in the verification to account for that in later slides. But the initial results fairly fairly substantial for temperature. Here is dew point, and in green would be the Weather Prediction Center output. You can see that uh, WPC fairly competitive with NDFD and actually improves upon it as you get closer to day six and seven. Here is what I was uh, referring to as we got into May. We started plotting what we call PC blend, which is the previous uh, blend, which is the one that would be available for the forecasters to look at, kind of like talking about the European comparing a 12Z European run to a 12Z NDFD is somewhat unfair, especially in the, in the eastern time zone, since you forecast this pretty much out by the time the output's available. So you notice that the, the triangle here is the verification of the previous run of the blend, which is still has fairly substantial uh, improvement uh, over the NDFD. What's interesting is, in a lot of these plots, is that the improvement isn't limited just to the extended from the global models. It actually extends all the way into the short term. And in fact, the improvement it seems to be more substantial in the short term, which is somewhat of a surprising result, given that we don't have any of the short term models in the blend yet. And here on dew point, you see uh, WPC is actually very competitive with with the uh, the latest version of the blend uh, out as you get into day six and seven. We wanted to also highlight one of the tools for evaluation is our National Blend of Models Viewer with the address here. Many of you have probably already been to it. You use your typical LDAP login and password like you would use to get into your, uh, into your typical NOAA accounts like your Google account. And you can evaluate both the analyses and the forecast on this site. Here's an example I chose from uh, the uh, monthly files from May, where you can actually quickly evaluate uh, long-term verification. And you see some, this is a, a zero Z temperature, 168 hour forecast, so essentially a day seven temperature, zoom picking on the east. And I'll pick on my friend Steve Zubrick in, in uh, Sterling area looks like there's a systematic warm bias of about six degrees in their zero Z temperatures and something that where the blend doesn't show up so much in the, uh, the, the blend output. Here you have about a four degree mean absolute error in, uh, in the Sterling CWA. And these numbers are for the entire CWA and then the individual grid points are plotted in these color curves. Even the previous version, it's not quite as good, but it, you lose about four tenths of a degree of mean absolute error. But it does does show uh, 
pretty substantial improvement. Going to day uh, seven dew point temperature, this little circle indicates a sampling point, which is kind of nice. For example, here it shows the mean absolute error between IRMA, which is IRMA is the RTMA, but it's the six-hour old version that has the latest amount of data. So it's basically our ground truth shows mean absolute error up in northern part of uh, Binghamton's CWA of about 7.2 degrees. What's nice on the sampling, it shows you the lat longitude and the the approximate elevation in meters of the of that. Uh, terrain and you can see the error at that time for the blend was 5.4 degrees, the previous version 6.1 and the WPC error 7.1 degrees roughly. So we often get questions about having too many members of the blend where the verification may not be as, as robust, uh, why not just use the European model or some of the better performing models? And again, if we look at verification, if you have inferior members that tend to be consistently uh, not verifying as well, why include them on the blend? Well, what we found is that this uh, Aristotle had a quote, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And a lot of times the individual members over the long term may not uh, perform as well, but on particular events they may be the best guidance. And it's very difficult at times to predict in advance which members will be most accurate. So you look at the, if the European MOS is truly the best model, then it should outperform the national blend of models. You would think, just, just thinking, uh, if, you pick the, if you pick the winner, it should do better than, than a blend of all the guidance. So we compared some, uh, on a training data set, early January to the middle of March of last year between the bias corrected European MOS and the national blend. And you don't see a whole lot of difference in the short term out to about day three or four. But as you get out further, the blend starts to have more and more improvement over the so-called best guidance, uh, which is, is quite interesting. And if you go to dew point, you see that the blend outperformed uh, the European MOS almost the entire period, but especially in, in the days five to seven. So it's difficult to always expect that we can separate out the very best guidance and expect, and expect the blend to improve. A lot of times it's the uh, impact of some of the other members that actually improve it, which might be counterintuitive. So I want to summarize here. We have, again, versus the static regional blends like super blend or consensus all or others, the, the dynamic model blend weightings change daily based on rolling 30-day verification. Um, one, another significant difference is that some of the regional blends have Raw, raw model components. And at this time, the national blend of models is more like a bias corrected consensus all, or it's a, it, it, all of the components are currently downscaled and bias corrected. And again, as we've hopefully shown, that the blending tends to outperform any of these individual components, even the best performing ones over longer periods of time. How are we giving feedback? <clears throat> uh, hopefully some of these instructions have pa been passed along, but if not, there, there's a couple of ways to, to do feedback. You can log into the virtual laboratory, look for the national blend of models, and join it, and then 
post on there's a feedback form that you can post directly to and attached images. Uh, there's, some, there's some instructions that were sent along in a PowerPoint by Paul Wollen of Pueblo that shows you how to step-by-step -step, uh, click and join the, join the forum. Another way, kind of our easy button, if you will, is to send an email to national.blend.feedback at noaa.gov and attach any images, and this will automatically post uh, to the Model Blend f uh, feedback forum on the v virtual lab. And one thing that we encourage you to do, uh, unless it's completely obvious from the images you're sending, it would probably be very helpful to us uh, for the model uh, developers that are going to be looking at your uh, feedback to provide the date and time of the event you're documenting, including the forecast hour that you're interested in, just to make sure that we, uh, that we you know, communi as you know, communication can sometimes be a little uh, arduous if you don't it, it might be obvious to you what the date is, but if you could put the date and the time, you could probably help uh, shorten the amount of time before we get back to you on feedback. So some of the things that we're really hoping to see uh, are specific uh, frontal passages and how the blend handled them from a variety of parameters. As we get deeper into the fall and we start picking up snow cover how how does the how does the blend handle temperatures particularly in uh, snow covered areas complex terrain of course which we knew would be one of the the most interesting items to quite a few of our offices actually have fairly complex terrain and uh and uh, mountainous areas. How does how do temperature and dew point and wind fields handle deep mixing and fire weather situations? The coastal areas, which another form of complex terrain, and when we have tropical systems, we obviously have in the extended ha often have landfalling tropical systems. How does the blend handle that? How when you use the TCM tool, if you try using it with the blend just to see what it looks like, you know, how, how does that work? So there's, there's quite a few things that we're specifically looking for feedback on. But really, anything that you happen to notice and, and want to document, even if you only have a few sentences and have a couple, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, good or bad, the developers would love to see positive feedback, that it's handling things well, or negative feedback, uh, things that we need to improve. Now, I've uh, come to the end of the presentation. We're, we're happy to have a question and answer period here. And again, John Gagan is on and, and can help answer, field any questions you might have. Hey Jeff, this this is Phil. Um, hey, just a question. Um, is there a reason why there's all the grids that only bias corrected are included? Um, I'm just thinking, like here in the plains at times, the uh, um, bias varies um, depending upon the regime and stuff. It's not necessarily a systemic bias, uh, bias at times. Yeah, I I have. Uh let, I have let them know that I have some concerns over over that. One of the problems with the with the with the resolution is that since terrain, you know, they're very concerned about correcting for terrain. And as you know, the some of the coarser models, like the European in complex terrain, are not not very good. Uh, Want to, I think they want to try it out where they make sure that they're handling the terrain properly. I do think that there needs to be a component of raw output and how, when and if they're going to do that, I, I'm not sure. 
but that feedback would probably be useful during this time, especially if you can document events where the raw output was superior. I think that would I think that would go a long way to justifying why we need some of that in the blend. Maybe not a huge portion, but some. Oh, hey, please go on. Lance in Houston. Uh, I'm curious as to what your recommendation is um, for this first phase. Are, are, is the expectation that we go ahead and populate our GFE with the guidance and go ahead and, and utilize it, or more just assessing it versus our own blend uh, at this point? I would say the latter. Since we don't have a lot of components yet, we have temperature and dew point, and then pretty soon we should have wind, max temperature, and min temperature. It would be difficult to ask the phase one WFOs to actually routinely harness and load and use for the forecast the output. I, and again, this is, this is my opinion, but I, I think that if you talk to most of the members of the team, you would probably get a very similar uh, answer to that question. We do want you to compare the output in GFE to what you actually forecast. And so, I, John, I mean, if you have a good, good idea of how we might recommend of doing the evaluation, uh, that, is that, am I on the right track here? No, I think you're absolutely on the right track. Just continue your operations as normal with the blends you're using now. Um, but, you know, do take some time from time to time to, to do that compare and contrast uh, uh, to, to provide feedback. Again, being a first phase data set right now, there, you know, there's the expectations that there's going to be little hiccups and, and, and problems along the way. Um, so this is this is merely a an observational phase. I think is the best way to put it. Yeah, the I think the end goal here is if there's some serious issues that we need to bring to the developers' attention now before uh, before the blend goes operational for quite a few elements in December, we need you guys to weed those out now, document them so that we can implement uh, fixes as soon as possible. So we're really looking for uh, any warts in the sausage that you might be able to find. Yeah, this is Dave Novak, uh, just listening in, and uh, really appreciate the, the response here of the, the testing offices and uh, the commitment to, to do this testing. I think, you know, the points just raised, you know, about bias correction and, you know, how it can fail sometimes are exactly the type of um, type of monitoring we're looking for and maybe unique uh, aspects that, um, you know, until you actually look at this day to day to day, uh, we might not see. So that, I, I, I don't know, Jeff, if that's what you're thinking, but, you know, I, I think we're looking for just kind of eyes on this and seeing what perhaps the developers aren't seeing. I, I do have one, uh, and again, Wednesday's talk will be essentially the same. We're just trying to offer it a couple of times, and we are recording it uh, for those who uh, could not attend. Just out of curiosity, um, do we have someone from Portland, Oregon? Uh, yeah, this is Bill Schneider. I'm on the line. Okay. And Great Falls, Billings? Great Falls is here. I'm sorry. And, and someone from Billings? How about Tucson? Yep, Tucson's here. Pueblo? Pueblo's here, Jeff. Okay, great. Santa Teresa? And we know Houston is on. And we know Sioux Falls. Anyone from Milwaukee? Yeah, we're here, Jeff. Okay, great. How about uh, Gaylord? Yeah, we're here. And Jacksonville? How about Greer? Greer's here. And Charlie West? Yeah, we're here at Charlie West. Okay. Burlington? Burlington's here. And Taunton? Yeah, Jeff. Joe's here from Taunton. Okay. So uh, 
based on that roll call, I can assume all of you are ingesting temperature and dew point grids. That's great. Uh, we'll add, add several of you to the list. Um, I can tell you that Lou, uh, our director, Louis Uccellini, is very, very big on this project, and we've been trying to keep him updated as offices come online and ingest the data. So that's very good to hear. Yeah, and maybe I'll put a fine point on that, Jeff. I mean, I really do, uh, you know, I think between Kathy and myself and Jeff really do hear uh, how important this is viewed uh, at the higher levels of management. In terms of, um, you know, uh, moving the forecast process uh, uh, towards a little bit more efficient approach. So um, it's, uh, it's really critical what you're doing that we get this right and uh, important that you're looking at the data and reporting, you know, any issues and uh, you've, got, you've got the agency's attention, uh, you know, with, with your, with your um, evaluation. So uh, it's important. So any, uh, any other questions or comments? Ripe tomatoes? Well, you're, yeah. you're welcome to, to shoot myself or Dave Novak or John Gagan an email if you have anything you didn't want to bring up in the, in the group audience. We're, we're all ears. And we'd love uh, Pueblo was the first official at least of the phase one WFO test bed offices to uh, give feedback. Uh, thanks to Dr. Wallen for that. And we're looking forward to uh, feedback uh, coming fast and furious. I know the developers, the developers really appreciated the amount of input they got during the upgrade of the RTMA and IRMA. And that's one of the reasons why we thought that you know a similar kind of freestyle uh, emails or forum posts with images to document issues that we see in the blend, uh, they're really looking forward to that. And now that we're kind of kicking into July and and going full forward with the test, we're we're excited to see your feedback, and we know that. We know that uh, it's peak leave season early on, and and, it, and it's tough sometimes to find enough bodies to cover shifts. So doing evaluations is extra work, and we do understand. But it, uh, we'd appreciate anything you could document and send along. So on that note, I think we can, if there aren't any questions, we can go ahead and, and end the call. And again, thanks, everyone, for, for joining in. Uh, appreciate your attention and thanks for volunteering for this important endeavor.